is a quick recap. Last month we had part one of 2020 for Jesus. What we did then was talk about who Jesus was, who, claimed, who did he claim to be, and what does scripture have to say about what he claimed to be, which was the son of God, and all the evidence that supported that. We also looked in more detail about what he meant when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we stand in a place in life where we can understand who Jesus is at this point. And we can fully embrace that we can have a transformed life. And if we accept him as our savior, that's exactly what we get. And there is joy to be found in that and everything surrounding it. So now what? Where do we take this? What does life look like with Jesus in it after this acceptance? Many of you here are mature Christians. So at this point, you're going to think, well, I already know this, so I'm going to tune him out. I don't need to know this. I'm going to switch off now because I know exactly what I'm doing already. You gave your life to Christ way back, and now you know exactly what you're doing. You know what you're supposed to do, and you're already doing it, right? But I would encourage you to listen. Find a renewal in this year, this 2020 for Jesus, to be able to bring him back into focus and what it means to have him in your life completely. We go to an optometrist and we have an eye test. We find out that our vision is not quite what we want it to be and it gives us a new prescription, a fresh pair of glasses, new lenses, new contact lenses, whatever it is that you use, and then we feel happy. Everything's back in focus again. But after time, we go back to the optometrist and they say, your vision's not quite as good as it was. Now you can't see as clearly as you could. So you need a new prescription, something even better, something even stronger. The things that we're looking at haven't changed. They're still exactly the same. It's our vision that has changed in the way that we look at them. So we need to renew our prescription. We need new lenses so that we can now see clearly what we couldn't see before. So in our faith, complacency can be the changing of our eyesight, the clouding of our vision, and refreshing our thoughts and perspectives on Jesus can be the new prescription, the new lenses that we need to bring it back into focus when time and complacency has made it drift. So when we first moved to Clovis 13 years ago, it seemed a little odd. <laughs> I've got to be perfectly perfectly honest. I was surprised by the difference between Clovis and Fresno, even though they're so close together. Clovis has a real lifestyle going on in it. There's some characteristics of Clovis. There's a lot more Western wear in Clovis. Amen. There's kind of a standard vehicle, which is a pickup truck. There's a lot more of those in Clovis. There's an old town, not a downtown. There's a paper they're called the Roundup. The rodeo is the largest event of the year. So it's a theme going on in Clovis. Clovis isn't just a town, it's a way of life. The Clovis way of life. That's how it's described in a lot of different places. You cannot live, you don't just live in Clovis, you live Clovis. It's a lifestyle. And you have to understand that as a British person, I mean I've been here for quite some time, but I lived in American cities that were fairly generic, coming into this particular environment, even though I'd been to Clovis on and off, it just came off as a little different. And I realized how cowboy it was. And I didn't even realize that, even though we lived very close to it. But then you get into it, and you begin to understand that there really is something to this Clovis way of life. I realized that I could actually embrace this. It has a feeling of a little more of an older, more simple time, even though it's still as fast-paced as any other place. My wardrobe now, and this was by design, my wardrobe now has boots in it, a little more plaid, even a Stetson. Jeans have become an everyday thing for me, and frankly, I'm comfortable with that. <clears throat> so this Brit can, can embrace the Wild West, well, not so much wild these days, but certainly the West, it's still the West. <laughs> but I know this is sounding a little bit like a commercial for the city of Clovis. But what I'm really saying is that when we see the Christian life from the outside, when you first move into the Christian life, sometimes it can seem a little odd, a little different. I'll be honest, my cousin was the first person in my family to really embrace a relationship with Jesus Christ. And she used words that sounded to us like somebody who had been captured by a fanatical group. 
At our family gathering, she talked about her faith, but it came off as something completely foreign to us. I'm sure it's frustrating for her that so many members of her family casually cast off any of her faith-filled sort of uh, comments and sometimes even joked at her expense because of it. Often we don't know what we don't know, the unknown, can be hard for, for us to see ourselves in it. There comes a point in life, we hope, when a light bulb goes off in our head, when we understand, we realize that. And that's the truth about God. We understand the relationship with Jesus and what it can do. And we can't undo that once we realize it. And once you get it, it's really important what you do with it after that. And that's the point we're going to talk about tonight. We can choose to ignore it. I'm not even sure how you do that once you really understand it. I think it's almost mentally exceptionally difficult to just undo the change in your brain once you realize this. But I know some people can do that. They can choose to visit that part of their life every now and then, come on a Sunday, allow themselves to experience that side of themselves, to worship, to pray, to take comfort in knowing that they're a Christian, to hang out with other Christians and know what it is they're supposed to say and do, but then they leave. Or we can choose, which is more what we're going to talk about tonight, we can decide that our walk with Christ is not just a stroll and then done. It's not just a weekly hike up a hill and then back down again and then we're finished. We can decide that our walk with Christ is a daily devotion. We can decide that everything in our lives will have some effect on our Christian life. Why? Because our Christian lives have an effect on everything in our lives. They are one and the same. They're not mutually exclusive. Our life is our life. There isn't a wall that stands between the Christian portion of our life and everything else. In the past I've preached about, and many people have preached about, the fact that Jesus is the center of our lives. We imagine Jesus in the center and everything else revolving around it. And there's a lot of value to this model. It's, it's very true. The hub, holding all the spokes, being at the center and everything else revolving around it. But imagine a slightly different picture. Now you see the outline of a body. You know in those movies where there's a murder, they put the outline of a body on the floor. There's probably some reality to that, I don't know. But... So there's the outline of a body. And inside that outline, there's lots of other small things. And all those small things are all the things in our lives, encompassed by the outline of the body, which is us. That could be our spouse, it could be our kids, our jobs, our friends, our hobbies, our fanatical obsessions with fish keeping, stamp collecting, airplanes. Everything that represents us is inside this outline. The reality of the expression of being in Christ is just that. We are in Christ. He surrounds us. So the outline of that body becomes him. He stands as that outline around everything that we do, everything that we have, everything that we feel is inside that perimeter. And this is the point of the expression that we find in Job 1, 9 and 10. And it goes, Does Job fear nothing for God? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the works of his hands so his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. So it says, you put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has. It's like the outline around everything. Psalm 91 is worth reading in his, as in his whole because it has so many things that talks about us being surrounded by God and the protection of this all-encompassing concept. Psalm 91 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings He will find refuge. His faithfulness will be his, your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but they will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands. 
so that you will not strike a foot against a stone. And you will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. For he, call, he will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life, and I will satisfy him and show my salvation. So here there is just such a clear picture of, of surrounding us with his protections. The imagery of refuge, of shadow, of shelter, fortress, cover you with his feather under his wings. It talks of ramparts, of walls. All of these words and expressions conjure up an image of being surrounded and protected by God. Jesus surrounding our life and everything in it. He didn't say we won't have any trouble. In fact, Jesus says we will. But the point is that we are protected with our faith. Because ultimately we have to remember what it says in 1 Peter 5.8. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So we need this hedge, this wall, the wall of protection from Jesus. And what this does in turn is ensure that everything in our world is also inside that wall, also covered by his protection. So what does this mean? Well, it means that when we make a conscious decision that we want a Jesus way of life, things change. Well, they should change. And that's the point of transformation. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Transformed. If we go through an awakening of the presence of Christ in our lives, part of that deal is transformation. If we accept Christ, if he wasn't there before, there has to be some kind of change. I don't accept that things will stay the same. Because if nothing changes in your life, then you're basically saying one of two things. You're firstly saying, my life was already on track and it's good. And having Christ in it doesn't change anything. I can believe, but it doesn't change anything in my life. Or secondly, it means that you're saying, I don't think Christ has anything to offer me in my life. I can believe him, but he's in a separate category in my life. And I just have him there as an accessory. Neither one of those makes any sense to me. Because when there is true understanding of what Jesus can do in your life, then things will change. The hedge, the walls, whatever we pour into our lives goes into this particular area. Nothing will be the same. You cannot treat anything the same again. Let me tell you a story of a great conquistador, Hernan Cortez. The conquest of Mexico by Cortes and his men is kind of a legend that's been passed down through the ages up to today, and it's been a turning point of the region of South America, Central America. The conquest didn't start until 1519, officially with the taking over of Veracruz, which is a coastal region on the other side of the Gulf of Mexico from Cuba. The conquest of Mexico was twofold. First was it was a military conquest, a military conquest of the land and of the people. Second, it was a spiritual conquest for the Catholic Church of the hearts and the souls of the people there. One of the first actions of Cortes upon capturing Veracruz was to order the sinking and burning of his own ships. Commonly thought to be burning, but it is contested, but generally thought that he burned his ships, they sunk, and they ended up at the bottom of the sea. So now there was no option for his men but to continue. What is certain is that the sinking would have set an irreversible course for the conqueror and his men, and they would either win or they would die trying. So when we make changes in our lives, it's hard. We start off well, we achieve some goals, some small victories, but there's always temptation sometimes to crawl back into our old ways, to find the comfort zone, the familiar zone behind us. And that's when it's hard to get back to where we were before, back to changing our lives for good. So when we make a decision to change, when we find a good reason to change, we must press forward. We must not look back, and we must avoid falling back into our comfort zone. We need to make a new comfort zone ahead of us. In business terms, we see people like entrepreneurs who have trouble keeping their new business going. They have trouble getting a new business started. Why? Because they keep one foot in their old job just in case. Sometimes this will hold them back. It'll make them feel like they have a backup plan. And often, 
That means that the motivation they have to make this business work and succeed isn't quite as strong as it could be. But if they quit their existing job, they burn that shit, there's no going back. Sink or swim, do or die. There's a song that the group for King and Country came out with in the late 2018 called Burn the Ships. And that's exactly about that story. For King and Country consists of two brothers, Australian brothers, Joel and Luke. The song was inspired by Luke's wife, Courtney, who was battling addiction. The couple had three sons, and during her second pregnancy, a doctor prescribed an anti-nausea medication that helped to help Courtney with debilitating morning sickness. Well, during the pregnancy, they continued to increase their dosage. And I was in Texas, Austin, Texas for the show, Luke recalls. Courtney calls me and says, hey, I need, to, I need you to come home. And I said, okay, what's going on? She said, I cannot stop taking these pills. We've got to deal with this. Luke returned immediately, took his wife to a psychiatric facility, and doctors placed Courtney in a treatment program. Luke dropped her off every morning at 9 a.m. and picked her up at 2 p.m. every day. I was at home one day, and she had a bottle of pills in her hands. And I was like, what do you have the bottle of pills for, he recalls. She said, Luke, I need to flush these pills because these pills represent so much guilt and shame in my life. I don't want to be consumed by my past anymore. I want to move forward into a new day and do uh, to what's before me. So just as Cortez said to his men, we're not going to retreat. We're going to move forward in our lives, no matter what. The flushing of the pills for Luke's wife was a burning of the ships for them to step into a new world, a new day. Some of the lyrics of this song go, How do we get here? All cast away on a lonely shore, I see in your eyes, dear, it's hard to take a moment more. We've got to burn the ships, cut the ties, send a flare into the night, say a prayer, turn the tide, dry your ears, and wave goodbye. Step into a new day. We can rise up from the dust and walk away. We can dance upon our heartache. So light a match, leave the past, burn the ships, and don't look back. Great lyrics. Move forward and don't you look back. We'll listen to this song at the end. Um, I have the video for it. So what does the Bible say? Luke 9.62 says, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The sense of this translation is putting your hand to the plow is a symbol of accepting and finding Jesus. And then once you've started plowing, you've started your life with Jesus, you should not look back. The thought that comes to mind immediately when you think in the Bible about not looking back is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19 verse 14. So when Lot came and went and spoke to his sons-in-laws who were pledged to marry to his daughters, he said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry, take your wife and two daughters who are here or they will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hands and the hands of his wife and his two daughters, and they led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. And soon, as soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. Don't look back. Don't stop. Keep going until you get to your destination, away from here. In this case, God burned the ships. He took down Sodom and Gomorrah. But this is a true illustration of how God wants us to flee sin. Go and go far and don't look back. Don't hesitate and succumb to the temptation to fall back into the comfort zone that was in our former lives, but keep moving forward. Jesus is a way of life. It keeps coming back to the fact that we cannot dabble in our faith. As we've seen, this is an all-encompassing, all-consuming. Even when we're doing what is considered to be secular things, they aren't. Why? Because as Christians, our actions in everything are important. Does the expression, what would Jesus do? WWJD. In fact, we have a whole bunch of key rings in the jam center now with those on. This expression is what people think about when, when they're in a situation and they think, what do I need to do now to reflect the teachings of Jesus? But the more precise thought is, what would Jesus, how would Jesus live my life? What would Jesus do if he was me? Not so much what would Jesus do if he was standing here advising me, but what would he do in my situation if he was actually me in the circumstances with my personality, my thinking process, my skills, what would he do? The Bible is clear about what lives we should lead 
and what our lives should look like once we burn the ships. The life we should be striving for, a life in the spirit. We had the scripture reading earlier. Galatians 5, most known for the passage on the fruit of the Spirit, but there's so much more around it to consider. It started with, you are called to be free. Well, that's good news. That kind of throws out this whole image of sitting at an old oak table with a crusty old Bible and a candle and thinking we should be devoted to religion. We are called to be free. That's good news. Then the warning comes. Yes, free, but don't misuse this freedom. We have the privilege of being able to use free will in all that we do, but let's choose to serve each other humbly and let's choose to love each other. The section, this section of Paul's writing so neatly illustrates my point, and in verses 16 through 21, this is what we leave behind. These are the ships to burn, the desires of the flesh, the earthly desires, people-driven things, not spirit-driven things. Just as a reminder, it says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit is what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that, we, so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those that live like this will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. But next, we step from this into the next section. So this is a transition. These are all the ships that we need to burn. Those are all the bad things. Leave them behind and burn them. But the transition comes in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. But the next bit's important because it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So that bit says, those who belong in Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh. They burned the ships. We throw things like this into the fire. That doesn't mean that they won't poke at us. It doesn't mean they'll revisit every now and then. They'll come up in life. But when we focus forward, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, on the Holy Spirit, then the fruit of the Spirit in our lives begins to fill the outline of that body that I talked about. And the more we fill that outline with the fruit of the Spirit, the less room there is for all the other stuff. And when we do that, Jesus becomes much more clear to us. We regain some focus. And looking back becomes a lot less attractive than it used to be. The country of Australia has two, picture, two animals pictured on its coat of arms. There's an emu and a kangaroo. This seems like strange choices. I mean, a big dumb bird, like an emu, and a kangaroo that just, they look kind of funny when they're hopping along. But there's more to it than that. You see, these two animals have very specific and unique characteristics that you don't see in any other land animals. It's impossible for them to move backwards. An emu has three, t three toes, and they're all on the front. So if an emu tries to go backwards, it just falls over. And a kangaroo can't move backwards because it has a long and heavy tail. So every time it tries to move backwards, it'll trip over it. So they just have to move forward all the time. They were picked to symbolize Australia as a nation that will never fall back, but always keep going against the odds. Jesus is a way of life. And it's the way forward this year and every year. As we work on gaining new focus, 2020 vision for Jesus... There may be things that distract us, moments when we feel like we want to go back to the way it was, our old comfort zone, an easy way out of life, and maybe even something that we keep on going back to, even though we know it's destructive in our own lives. But if we burn those ships, leave ourselves no options, just move forward, battling on with Jesus, now as a partner in everything that we do, because we know that we're not going to have just smooth sailing. But now we have Jesus as a partner. And our comfort zone emerges. A new comfort zone emerges. And this time, this comfort zone finds us less fearful, less stressed out, less guilt-driven, less reliant on things that are full of destruction in our lives. But what we find is more joy, more productivity, more healthy relationships, and more hope, no matter what comes our way. Frankly, we just find more Jesus, a way of life.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please accept us for all our sins as we know you do. And just, Lord, we just pray that we can analyze ourselves, look at ourselves and say, what is it that we need to leave behind? What is it that we need to burn? What is it we need to throw in the fire and never look at again so that we can move forward to find a new comfort zone? To examine the outline of our body and say, what's inside it that we need to that we need to include you in and what is it that we need to fill ourselves with in the fruit of the spirit that perhaps we haven't already. We also want to understand that the more we do that, the less room there is for everything else. So we can find a new comfort zone. We can find new joy. We can find new and healthy relationships. Lord, we thank you for the wisdom that you impart in Galatians 5. That you can show us this transition that we can make and we just pray that we will all make this transition. And we will do it as soon as we can and never look back. Lord, we pray all this in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.